So the thing that, uh, that brings us here today to this workshop here at Stanford University is a, is a, is a set of shared beliefs. Um, we believe in the power of an abstraction, um, that we should be able to specify how packets, that we should be able to define how packets are processed in a high-level language such as, such as P4. And we share this belief that a compiler should take our programs and then generate a executable code that can run on a very fast pipeline device. So we share these, we share these beliefs, and essentially what we're doing is we're producing domain-specific processes, a domain-specific language. We're in the realm of processes. And what we're trying to do for networking is what our speaker today did for the entire world of computing. Um, we all know about the RISC processor. We all learned about the RISC processor. And today, it's estimated that about 99% of all the CPUs in the world are based on RISC. And so it's most fitting that our keynote speaker today is John Hennessy. So John is chairman of the board at Alphabet, the parent company of Google, and serves on the board of the director of Cisco Systems. So he's very well uh, familiar with us. Many of you also know that John was the 10th president of Stanford from 2000 to 2016. Here he is fulfilling some of his presidential duties. Um, when I joined Stanford in 1995, John was my lab director. And uh, in rapid succession, he became CS department chair, Dean of Engineering, Provost, and then Stanford President. Many of us, including me, have, have benefited from his, his uh, generous mentorship over the years. As President, John grew Stanford's reputation by an enormous amount in many profound ways, too many to mention here. But if you want visual evidence, just wander around the engineering quad, the new engineering quad that we have as a sort of a testament to the enormous, some of the enormous changes he's, uh, he's brought through a real tireless devotion to Stanford. Today, John runs the Knight Hennessy Scholars Program on campus. It's the largest fully endowed graduate level scholarship program in the world. And it brings and then trains graduate students to be future global leaders. I can tell you from first-hand experience that John takes this job extremely seriously. He even wrote a book, uh, Leading Matters, describing his personal journey, but a journey to understand what leadership is all about. And in it, he writes, the question before us now is whether these traits can be taught, and if they can, how? I highly recommend the book uh, to anyone who wonders uh, how leadership comes about and whether we can train and how we can train, uh, train the next generation of global leaders. But of course, most of us know John and came to know John and his work through his early days at uh, MIPS, founding MIPS in the early 1980s, in the early days of RISC. Um, actually, this is him reviewing, is it reviewing the MIPS chip layout, I think about 1984. I'd actually like to see what a CPU layout would look like today if you printed it out. My guess is it would cover about half of California. Right? So while RISC is best known for reducing and simplifying the instruction set, you can also think about RISC as turning a CPU into a very simple pipeline that can run blindingly fast. That's how I think of it. The original MIPS RISC architecture inspired pretty much every processor and domain-specific processor since. DSPs, GPUs, TPUs, and in fact, it inspired the PISA architecture, which is used by Tofino. He authored the two biggest selling international textbooks in computer architecture, um, now in its sixth edition. I bought my first copy in grad school in 1990, and it's been my Bible for, for and for probably for many of you, for the last 30, 30 years. Uh, last year, John and Dave Patterson received the Turing Award, and the nomination said, many view the IBM 801 project, uh, which was really the main precursor of, of RISC, as having shifted the balance of power from a hardware microarchitecture to software-based compiler-centric techniques, building on the IBM 801 legacy and moving RISC into the VLSI era, culminating in their co-authored textbook, among the most widely used books in the field of computing, Hennessy and Patterson virtually created the foundations of modern computer architecture in these finest traditions of computer science. Here, here. So please join me in welcoming John Hennessy.
Thank you, Nick. That was a great introduction. One my father would be proud of and my mother would believe. So <laughs> on with the talk. So one fascinating point about the introduction that Nick gave, um, the shared experience that Dave and I both had before we embarked on our projects was involved in basically microcoded machines. That was Dave's PhD thesis, it turned out, building a compiler for that. And I had done some work for Jim Clark's uh, geometry engine and some work that came along on the MicroVax 2, the original single chip version of the VAX architecture. And both of us learned the same thing, namely, there was a lot of hardware overhead and a lot of interpretive overhead in those machines. So we were both driven by this vision of making the compiler more powerful and bringing it down closer to the architecture. Okay, what we want to talk about is what's happening now. Um, if I had known in the 19, early 1980s that the microprocessor would take over the rest of the computer industry, I'd be in a very different place right now, and so would most of the industry. Most of the players at the time simply didn't understand what was about to happen. And if you look at that 40 years of progress, it's absolutely astonishing. 40% compounded performance growth per year. Okay, now, if you had that in automobiles, your Tesla would cost $3,000. It would drive across the entire country on one battery charge. And when you got to the other side, you'd pack it up and put it in your pocket so it didn't take up a parking space in New York City. So it's absolutely stunning. And of course, driven by the dramatic uh, underlying technology, what happened in the integrated circuit, uh, and then architects, really the job of architects for so long was to take what Moore's Law was enabling and turn it into performance. So you go from 8-bit to 16-bit to 32-bit to 64-bit. You go from 10 cycles per instruction to multiple instructions per cycle. You go to very deep pipelines to allow the clock rate to speed up incredibly fast. Um, so three, 3 megahertz, that's what the 8-bit version of the Intel microprocessor was, um, up to multiple gigahertz. Um, it is the IC technology that enabled that. And there are two components to that. Everybody talks about Moore's Law, the end of Moore's Law. First of all, there is no law in Moore's Law. A law means a theorem, something you can prove, right? Moore's Law is an ambition. But it's an ambition that drove the entire semiconductor industry. Um, there's also a thing called Dennard scaling, which isn't called Dennard scaling law because it ended. So, um, but Dennard scaling is really the most important thing that's broken immediately. And people focus so much on Moore's Law that they ignore Dennard scaling. What's happened in Intel microprocessors is dominated by Dennard scaling. It's not dominated by the end of Moore's Law. And I'll show you some, some data. Um, Dennard scaling is a simple observation that Bob Dennard, the inventor of the one transistor DRAM cell made, namely that as you scale down, you would scale down voltage. You would also decrease capacitance. But the big thing is voltage scaling because power is proportional uh, to CV squared, to the square of the voltage, you would scale down the voltage and thereby preserve the amount of energy per square millimeter of silicon would be constant. So think about that. Energy is constant per square millimeter. That means, or power per square millimeter, that means the amount of computation you can get per square millimeter is going up as fast as Moore's law. And that's what was really happening for so many years. So the, we are driven by a lot of changes occurring at the same time. Technology changes, architectural changes, which arise from limitations in our ability to exploit what was the cornerstone of the roadmap for so long, instruction level parallelism. Um, the grim reality of Amdahl's law, which contrary to some papers that people wrote, has not been repealed. It's not been overcome. It's not been violated in any way. It's still there. And in fact, in these large data centers, uh, a, a, a significant problem. Not a dominating problem, but a significant problem. But also a shift in application. The most important computers aren't on your desktop anymore. They're sitting in your pocket, and they're in the cloud. 
So there's a whole change in how we think about computing that's very different. OK, well, if you look at what's happened in, uh, this is a performance curve, single, um, single core performance. I mean, you see this curve going up, this dramatic period from 86 to the early 2000s, where we're going up by 52% a year. Then a slowdown, more and more slowdown. Last two years, 3.5% per year. That's a big disappointment compared to 50 or 40 or 30. <clears throat> And if you look at DRAMs, you'd see something, uh, you'd see a similar kind of curve. Um, looking at DRAMs is a bit of a mixed bag because they're such a specialized technology, so they can mislead you a bit on what's happening. It's as much driven by power, it's also driven by technology issues. But you see what's happened in DRAMs. Each generation of DDR has taken two to three years longer than it was predicted to take. So we keep going up in terms of next generations. DDR5 may never happen. And that's a, real, that's a real change. So here's what's happened in Moore's law. If you look at in, just using Intel microprocessors as a benchmark, if you look at this over that, we're off by a factor of 10x. But being off a factor of 10x when you've gone basically through six out orders of magnitude, 10x is a drop in the bucket compared to six orders of magnitude. Now, if you really look at it, you'd say, well, the big differential came as sort of beginning in 1998. Yeah, but that's still from 1998 up there, it's four orders of magnitude, and we've lost one order of magnitude. So Moore's law isn't exactly hitting a dead stop wall. It's slowing down. Costs of fabs are going up. So the cost per transistor is dropping even more slowly than Moore's law would say it traditionally dropped. But we're not quite dead in the water there yet. We are much closer to dead in the water on Dennard scaling. So this plots on the blue curve the improvement in technology uh, density on nanometers and then the increase, the energy uh, cost. Now, you have to be a little careful here because you see how, that, see how the jump is. There's a jump around 2007, and that's the beginning of when that curve uh, begins to take off. What that says is that the energy going to be spent for computing is no longer going to drop so quickly. Think about what that means. It means power efficiency becomes much, much, much more important. And optimizing that power becomes a critical issue. But of course, it's also driven by what's happening on the application front. Right? All of a sudden, you care about how long a device lasts because it's battery powered. You care about. Um, what that energy consumption is inside there. And the processor is a significant piece of it, not the biggest piece necessarily. Although as these devices go to always on, even when the screen is off, the processor is going to become a much bigger power consumer. What a lot of people don't realize is that energy is also a big driver for people who are designing in the cloud. Um, if you look at the capital cost of the cloud, the biggest servers and the cooling and power infrastructure in terms of capital cost are roughly the same. When you amortize those things, servers end up costing a little more, but that's because their lifetime is more like three to four years versus power and cooling infrastructure 10 to 15 years. Uh, but of course, you also have to pay for energy, which is why all these big data centers sit next to former aluminum smelting plants, uh, because there's lots of energy available. So energy becomes a big driver in the, law, in the cloud as well. So it's really the end of Dennard scaling that's pushed this crisis in general purpose processors so acutely. Um, processors have also reached their thermal power limit. Um, we're at the point where we can't get more power out of the chip. If you had told me 20, 25 years ago that Intel processors would actually slow the clock down, would actually turn off cores to prevent themselves from burning up. I would have said, you're crazy. That's never going to happen. We're never going to have to do that. But in fact, that is exactly what we do. It's exactly what we do. So we've got a real major uh, issue there. Not a simple problem to solve. Um, yes, you could burn more power in this device, provided you're willing to put a little tube with water coming out the back and wear a radiator on your back, right? That would work. Most people might object to that, but it would work. Um, so now we're in this age where 
architectural improvements have got to think about improving energy efficiency. And unfortunately, the techniques we've used for the last 15 or 20 years have not worried so much about efficiency because they didn't need to. Moore's Law was bailing them out year after year after year. So the hardware guys could do all this hard work. The software people could just sit there and say, we don't need to change anything. These guys are going to do magic and run our old code faster and faster every single year. Right? End of the road. End of the road for that uh, approach. And it's all over the place. Take caches, one of the most beloved ideas in computer architecture, one of the grandest ideas in computer science. Think about a cache. The bigger you make it, the more the power goes up, but the less you actually utilize of that cache. Right? So lo if locality works, then you're, not gonna you're gonna use just a limited portion of locality of the cache. If locality doesn't work, then the cache is a pain in the neck anyway, and you don't want it there, it actually costs power. So the, all these ideas we've had are kind of hitting the wall. Take the instruction level parallelism error. I mean, this is phenomenal. You think about those early risk machines, five stage pipelines, the first, the first lower end machine to do pipelining. Um, now 15 stages, more than 15 stages. Uh, if you take a part of Sky Lake, it's 15 stages not counting instruction fetch, branch prediction, instruction cache stuff that all happened before that. So if you really look at it, it's more like 20, 24 stages long. Um, very deep pipelines to allow the clock rates to get up. Lots of instructions per clock. And really, we got hit by diminishing returns in efficiency. And the simplest way to understand that is to look at the speculation. Right? All these machines use speculation, and the dilemma around Meltdown and Spectre is that if you decide you're concerned about security and you turn off speculation, you'll throw away probably more than half the performance for typical benchmarks, as much as, as, much as probably 70% on some benchmarks. So that's not an approach that's terribly attractive. But the problem with speculation is it's great when it's perfect, but it is speculation. And it's based on predicting the behavior of programs dynamically. So if you look at how, how good does that prediction have to be? Well, take a part of Skylake processor, right? It's got a 15-stage pipeline. It's got four instructions per clock. There are 60 instructions in flight, typically. The machine can actually support more than 60. But there are 60 instructions that are being operated on at any given time that I've guessed through multiple branches. In order to do that, I've got to guess all those branches. 15 branches correctly if all those instructions are going to be successfully executed. In order to predict 15 branches correctly, even with just a 90% accuracy, I have to predict each branch with a 99% accuracy. And that's what's really hard. So if you look at uh, what happens inside a modern i7 processor, what you see is that there are a lot of instructions which get executed because they were executed speculatively that then get thrown away. And if you look at that number, something, depending on the benchmark, something like 20% of the instructions. So 20% of the instructions, I do all the work to execute the instruction. Then it gets to the end of the pipeline. I say, whoops, got that branch wrong. Throw that instruction away. And by the way, not only do I have to pay all the energy for all those wasted instructions, but I have to pay the energy to restore the state of the processor back to what it should be before I guess the branch incorrectly. And that's why this technique hit the end of the road. So then everybody says, OK, let's switch to multi-core. I can't figure out how to do this ILP thing anymore. It was great. It was a nice ride. Let's switch to multi-core. And now we'll get the programmers be responsible for finding all the parallelism, right? Forget the hardware guys doing it. Let's stick the job on the programmers, right? Like magic, right? The only problem was that nobody, everybody had abandoned parallel computing because conventional processors were going faster and faster and forgot, oh, well, there's a small software set of issues we have to worry about. Um, and the basic fundamental problem is that energy is proportional to the number of cores you have active. Therefore, you need performance to go up at roughly the same ratio, or you're going to be having, you're going to encounter energy inefficiency. And that's a hard problem. Amdahl's law is still around. Um, 
Oh, wrong direction. And if you look at that, this is a classic Amdahl's Law plot, right? And if you get 64 processors and you have 1% of the time is in serial mode, you get a speed up of less than 40. And these large data centers see these kinds of effects. They see small amounts of serialization which add up and which limit the ability to completely paralyze the application the way you'd like to in a theoretical idealistic framework. But there's another problem. And that's how many of those cores can actually be active at any given time. And that does that impose an additional limit. So if you look at what happens with packaging, it improves by about 5% a year in terms of thermal dissipation. Um, but if you look at where we are, well, take the, take the uh, Intel E7-8890, right? High-end 24-core uh, processor. In turbo mode, it can run at 3.4 gigahertz. So that's basically what the speed of one core can actually run at. Think of it as the design limit for the technology that it's in. Um, but it can't run 24 core at that. 24 core can only run at 2.2 gigahertz. Because if you try to run more than one core at 3.4 gigahertz, it stops you, turns the clock rate down, turns off cores, right? Uh, if you were to take that, if you were to run every core at 3.4 gigahertz, you'd have about 255 watts. There's no package in a, in a PC-like device that's going to uh, eliminate 255 watts. So you hit that power limit very quickly. And if you then take that process up, things get worse. 64 core processors, you're going to have unconstrained, you'd have about 365 watts. Um, very unlikely that you're going to take 365 watts out of a little piece of silicon just about that big. Imagine a 365 watt light bulb and how big it has to be, and you don't want to go near it with your hands, right? So this piece of silicon, it's really hard to do. So what happens when you begin to extrapolate is you say, given the thermal dissipation power, I'm not going to be able to have all 64 cores active. You know, depending on what you might get, I have between 46 and 56 cores active. But of course, that further impacts an Amdahl's law effect. So instead of getting something that goes up to 40, you find when you get out to 64 cores, you can only get about 35 or 34 with 1% um, being in sequential mode. So this power limitation is another thing on top of the issue of how parallel the program is. So, sidebar, uh, this is a short sidebar. Uh, when you really look at why the risk ideas really won out in the long term, not so much on the desktop, but in the mobile space and all these other spaces, it was because the instruction set efficiency really became a key driver. And in places where you care a lot about power efficiency or things, instruction set efficiency becomes a key driver. And that was the underlying thing um, that really um, was key to the long-term success of the ideas. So what's left to do? Well, let's get the software people to do some more. Um, you know, the modern languages we use, and I'll show you an example with Python, they're not what I would call efficient. They're not what I would call efficient. And I'll show you how inefficient they can be in a second. Um, efficient for programmers, but not for execution. We've really put the emphasis on developing software systems which enable much higher software productivity, but which sacrifice lots of efficiency in order to do that. A hardware-centric approach. The only way we're going to get past this deadlock we're at with general purpose processors is domain-specific ideas. There is no other great idea out there. Uh, quantum computing, but I'll probably be dead before we get a lot of those. Um, OK. So. I dare just do a few things, but do them well. Some combination. Um, these domain-specific ar architectures are going to require domain-specific languages, as Nick mentioned, and I'll say something about that in a minute. But let's just look at a simple question of how efficient things are. So this is an experiment done by some of our colleagues at MIT in a paper that's going to be in science called there's, there's Plenty of Room at the Top. So they take a version of matrix multiply, admittedly a fairly simple piece of code, uh, they write it in Python, then they rewrite it in C. It's 47 times faster than the Python version. Now, I was a compiler person before I became an architect. Compiler people kill for factors of two. 
they kill their mother and their whole family for 47. You know, it just doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Then they take that version and they, uh, they make parallel loops in it. That gets a factor of eight. Then they take that version and they optimize the memory. They block it so it makes uses of the cache. That gets a factor of 20. Then they use the Intel vector instructions uh, to take advantage of the SIMD capability. Uh, the whole thing runs, yes, that's right, 65,000 times faster than the original version. So, admittedly, a toy example and one that's highly optimizable, but, you know, factors of 10? Yes, yes. Factors of 20? Probably uh, through some set of techniques. Um, these are going to have to be different techniques than we've used before, but there's a lot to be done there. Okay. Go forward. Oh, there we go. Okay, so these domain-specific architectures, really what we want to do is we want to achieve um, more performance by tailoring the architecture much more closely to what the machine needs, what the application needs. Um, GPUs for graphics, obviously network processors, um, domain-specific uh, things for uh, deep learning, all kinds of things. So the first question you might ask is, how do you know these are going to be any better? And if energy efficiency is the key factor, how are you going to, where is that energy efficiency going to come from? So this just shows you, this is from a paper that Mark Horowitz wrote, um, what the energy to do certain operations on a general purpose processor are. So 8-bit add, 0 0.03 picojoules, even a 32-bit add, 0.1 picojoules. By comparison, a register file access, 60 times the energy of a 32-bit add. An L1 cache access, uh, 10, 100 times the energy. 100 times the energy. So you can see where a lot of this energy goes to. Control per instruction in a superscalar. Probably 200 times the energy per instruction as the actual add operation that instruction may be doing. So lots of energy overhead in these other uh, functions. Uh, and in fact, if you take a typical, let's say, loading a register from the L1 cache, where does the energy go in executing that instruction? 53% of it to control, control overhead. 18% uh, to the L1 ca I cache access, just the I cache access. 18% to the D cache access and 11% to the register file access. Similar kind of plot here for floating point multiply. Key thing, lots of energy is spent on control, lots of energy is spent on getting the instruction and figuring out what to do with it. So. Why, could D, why should DSAs be faster? And I think, um, you know, if you've looked at the books that Dave and I wrote, you'd guess that we'd want to see a quantitative re set of reasons around why these should be faster. So here are the, I, what I think the key issues are. First of all, move to a simpler model for parallelism that gets more efficiency. SIMD versus MIMD, right? We're trading off, we are trading off something there. Less flexibility, but for much greater uh, potential simplicity in terms of the performance. A VLIW versus speculative, if you can make the hardware work well by a software mechanism, then a VLIW versus speculative machine. More efficient use of memory hierarchy. Um, caches are great, except when they either don't work or they have way too much overhead. Um, when you start to begin to think about user control memory hierarchies, the problem has always been the software. So we've got to figure out how to make the software cooperate with the hardware. Otherwise, you can't move to a user-controlled memory hierarchy. It's simply too hard a problem. Uh, eliminate unneeded accuracy. Um, well, we went through this whole big thing with IEEE. We got very accurate arithmetic. And it turns out it, we didn't need arithmetic that accurate. And it cost a lot of energy to get arithmetic that accurate. So get rid of it. Go to some simpler mechanism and get a programming model which matches the hardware in a much better way so that the compiler problem is now tractable. Right? The problem of taking, nobody is going to take a piece of C code and compile it for a domain-specific architecture and get really decent code out of it. It's just too hard a problem. Right? Lots of people broke their pick on this in various ways in the 1990s. It's too hard a problem. So you've got to get to a, domain, a level of abstraction uh, that makes this possible. So the domain-specific languages are a key part of getting this solution. 
You've got to get operations up to a higher level. If I'm doing tensors, tell me I'm doing tensors. If I'm doing matrix multiply, make it clear I'm doing matrix multiply. Don't force the compiler to have to extract all this information out, which will be impossible if there are functions and function calls because the aliasing problem is just too hard. So you've got to get that information up to a higher level so that the new version of a compiler can actually target the architecture appropriately. So what about domains? Are there interesting domains out there? Well, for this group, obviously, networking is one. But obviously, the favorite domain of everybody now is deep learning. Everybody wants to do deep learning. And the advantage is the interest level, as measured by the number of papers being published in the ML ArcV, is actually growing as fast as Moore's Law. <laughs> so Moore's Law may be slowing down, but the number of papers in deep learning is not slowing down. So here's an incredible. Uh, and you know, one interesting way to think about what's happening here is what machine learning does, it replaces what could be an enormously difficult, laborious, long coding process with a lot of cycles for training and lots of data to train things. So we shift the burden from the programmer to tremendous amounts of compute power to do the training function in particular, a fair amount to do inference, but a lot to do compute. Uh, and that way, we get something that's not only flexible, easy to change. I get new data. I reprogram it. I don't have to go in and rewrite all this code and take millions of lines of code. The best example of this is the Google Translate. The number of uh, amount of lines of code in the ML version is one, one five hundredth the amount of lines of code in the, in the version that they used earlier that's a phrase-based um, translation mechanism. So let's just take an example, a simple example here. Um, uh, first generation TPU, if you were to take this apart, what you'd see is it's got a giant matrix multiply unit in it that can do 64,000 8-bit matrix multiply accumulates every single cycle. That's a lot of, uh, a lot of arithmetic capability. Uh, and a lot of memory uh, designed to support particularly um, inference and deep learning kinds of problems. So a big hunk of memory. And this is the, this is the uh, comparison I find interesting. If you take the floor plan of the TPU-1 and you compare it to the floor plan of a single Skylake core and look at where does the area go. So in the TPU-1, 44% to memory, 39% to compute. Look at where compute is on the Skylake. 21%. And how much to, how much to memory? Cache, 44% versus 33%. Uh, and then there's this control line. 30% of the Skylake core is control. And in the TPU one, 2% is control. So I'm dedicating the hardware much more to the functions I need to do because I'm going to narrow the range of applications I try to do well. So here's one simple, this is an interesting idea because this is an old idea replayed into this uh, space. Uh, it's an old idea called systolic arrays invented in Charles Lysenson's thesis in a paper with H.T. Kung in 1979, which kind of faded out um, and now is the cornerstone of what's inside the TPU. And what a systolic array does, what was really attractive about it early on was it uses nearest neighbor communication, and that's all it uses. So it's a very efficient computing mechanism if you could do nearest neighbor communication. And in the early days... That was driven by the fact that there was only one metal level in the original CMOS VLSI technologies. So it drove basically trying to get nearest neighbor communication. But nearest neighbor communication does something else really great for you. It gives you very low energy cost because communicating signals across a big piece is a big part of where the power goes. So if you look at how these things work, you basically load up data in here. So if you've got, you've got a set of weights, I mean, you're doing a deep learning problem, basically you're doing sparse linear algebra, you're multiplying a bunch of set of weights by values, and you're doing a, 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 a MAC, a matri uh, multiply accumulate operation. So you load the data in, it comes in, you communicate it over, you begin doing the computation this way, and you end up producing results at the bottom, completely pipeline fashion, all nearest neighbor communication. But here's what's interesting about it. For a 64K matrix unit like the one that's inside TPU1, the energy from eliminating a register access, think about how you do this computation on a vector machine, for example. 
You have this giant set of vector registers. You unload the vector, you load the data from the vector register, you do the multiply, accumulate, you write the data back to the vector register. Uh, and that's the way you do it. So it's, it's highly parallel, but it also involves its access to the vector register. The amount of energy consumed with getting the data out of the vector registers exceeds the amount of energy consumed by the matrix unit. So you spend most of your energy communicating data. That's not true in the systolic array because all the communication is local. So that's the key driver behind rethinking these things in a rather different way. And if you look at what the performance you get out of these, um, you get really great performance out of them. Compared especially to general purpose processors, the performance per watt is much better. Uh, and the performance per watt, even compared to a GPU, which is a more general structure, it uses floating point, for example, uh, even there you get a significant, uh, a significant benefit. Where does it, so where does this benefit come from? Um, one really good way to look at these things are these so-called roofline models. So what a roofline model does is it has two pieces to it. Uh, it has a piece that's at an angle here. So let me, the, first of all, the x-axis is what we call arithmetic intensity. That is, uh, how many flops, how many arithmetic operations do I get to do for every piece of data I bring into the processor? So think about large problems. You're doing a gigantic matrix multiply, right? It's sparse, but it's a million by million, let's say. Are you doing a giant matrix multiply apply like that? How many operations do I get to do for each piece of data I bring into the processor? What's nice about that, it puts the focus on getting lots of arithmetic operations, energy cheap, versus expensive operations, communication, energy expensive. So you're trying to shift that. The, a slant here is basically deter determined by how much memory bandwidth you have. And then the flat part of the roof is determined what your arithmetic bandwidth is. So once you get the data in, how hard can you pound on it? So if you look what a TPU does uh, compared to a GPU, um, it kind of parallels that it's slightly lower uh, performance early on because of the limitation on memory bandwidth. But then it goes up much higher because it has much higher arithmetic bandwidth. So once it gets the data in there, assuming people write code that makes efficient use of the on-chip memories, uh, you can get much higher performance. Uh, what about the demand for this performance? The demand is phenomenal. The cost to train these large neural networks is simply phenomenal. This is a chart showing roughly how much, how much performance you need so there's AlexNet, one of the earliest uh, ML breakthroughs. Um, and there's Alpha Zero. Uh, notice that that's about six or seven orders of magnitude more uh, computation to train it. So the amount of training time is phenomenal. And if we're ever really going to get to things that are GANs or reinforcement learning, that training times are going to go through the roof because they're really uh, hard problems. So lots of compute demand there. Um, so the other, one of the other advantages of these is we no longer have object code compatibility the way we've had it for so many years in the conventional processor world. You know, if you build Intel processors, you are not changing the existing architecture. I don't care how bad some instruction is, how ugly it is to interpret it on your pipeline. I don't care about that. You are not changing that. And for most of them, you're going to make it run faster no matter what, right? That's the kind of game you're in. So now you sweep that all away and say, well, if I've got a domain-specific language and that's my interface, not object code, then I can change the underlying architecture provided that my compiler can still compile efficiently to it. So that's enabled uh, the guys at Google to build these series of TPUs relatively quickly. Uh, bring up each one. The architectures are relatively simple. And they're now, they're now on the third generation, uh, increasing the number of flops every time, increasing the amount of memory. Uh, and the last version is liquid cooled. So um, that's a training only. You're not going to use that for inference. It's not going to go on your phone for great pictures. Um, it's going to sit in a data center uh, somewhere. But this compatibility at the DSL level is a key driver to enable this. Um, you can also stack these things in, to build massive supercomputers out of them. Um, so they have built-in 
uh, parallel interconnect, so they don't require any external uh, logic to build up. And um, you can build a 256 processor using TPU version 3s. Uh, it has 32 terabytes of high bandwidth memory. Uh, it's liquid cooled, um, but it's a large scale system. And the amazing things um, about these things is that they're actually competitive with the fastest computers in the world while being roughly four times as energy efficient as them. So you can get to tremendously high performance levels while still, um, still being much more energy efficient than other approaches. So I think we're in this very interesting time with a rebirth of how we think about architecture, um, rethinking the interface between our software models. For a long time, our interface was what came out of a C compiler. Now all of a sudden we're moving up the stack. Um, it requires you to rethink problems. Um, we get to think about how to verticalize that discussion about what an architecture should look like. It's not just a bunch of silicon guys sitting there saying, OK, it's, I know what it looks like. It's not changing. It's a different model. Um, we can think about how to build hardware very differently. Think about how to prototype things faster and come out with different kinds of designs. Somebody may figure out a way to make Moore's Law last another 20 years. I hope so. Um, but if they don't, we're, go we're gonna have to continue moving in this direction uh, in order to get uh, performance. So I just wanna conclude with this. This is a great quote, um, as much because it's historically amazing that uh, Dave Cook made this observation in 1975. So Dave Cook worked on the ILLIAC 4, one of the first early, second big SIMD machine after a Goodyear machine. Um, big machine, advanced technology. They were pushing the envelope to really try to see how far they could push uh, computing in the time. Uh, Dave was the software architect. The meaning software architect one and only. And that probably was a hint that they were going to have some problems right there. They had a lot of hardware guys. They had a software architect. And you know, his experience was, well, they built this machine, but damn, we couldn't figure out how to use it. Um, and that's a reminder that if we're going to be successful in this domain-specific world, it's going to require a much tighter integration across more levels in the stack than we've traditionally had to work with. We've got to understand not only what the applications look like, how they might be compiled, what the domain-specific languages look like, and what the right underlying architecture is. And if we do that, I think we'll be able to find ways to get around the limits of Denner scaling and Moore's law and deliver remarkable performance for at least a broad set of interesting, high-performance demand applications um, for a few decades to come. All right, thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. If, if I may ask a first question. Sure, Nick. Which is there are these laws in you know, Moore's Law and Dennett scaling yeah. for conventional sort of the, the processing technology and for how it affects compute. Um, what are the, I mean, domain-specific architecture is a, is a catch-all for just anything that's not general purpose, that's specific to a domain. Yeah, what it's are something general that's programmed as opposed to, what are as the opposed patent? to, right? I mean, this has, a, this has a modem inside, but I don't really right. think about ever downloading code into it, right? Right. Is there a general kind of approaches, rules, um, oh. that, will, that, you, that you expect will, I mean, we've seen small numbers of examples of domain-specific architectures so far. Yeah. Is, there, is there things that we can see here? I mean, I you think, mentioned parallelism. I, I, I think some, you can see some fragments of it, right? Exposing parallelism, exposing uh, memory behavior of code mm -hmm. so as to better be able to compile for it, deep pipelining, Lots of ideas from vector machines, but turned on their head a little bit, turned sideways a bit. Um, probably, uh, right, right now, I mean, we're at a, we're at a stage where uh, two different methods are being used to solve for memory latency. Mm -hmm. So the GPU community is using multi-threading to deal with memory latency. Uh, people like the TPU people are using software prefetch ideas. 
they're similar in flavor. To do either one of them well, mm -hmm. you have to have um, some notion of what the underlying code is. I mean, you're not, anybody who thinks they're ever gonna, you, you write in CUDA you, and you know what you're doing, you can get great performance out of a GPU. You write in C and expect decent performance out of a, forget it, it's not gonna happen. So I think we're beginning to see ideas like that that'll form the framework. But right now, you know, in the early stages, I'd say it's much more of structure by example. Later on, I think people will be able to codify those things and say what the underlying important ideas are. Good. Any uh, questions from the, from the audience? Nate. So you made the case that these domain-specific approaches are the only way forward. But you also mentioned approximation as a thing that we could do. Mm, mm. How much gain do you think there is from approximation? And do you big. have thoughts on, on how, it, how it affects as you go higher up the stack? Because it doesn't yeah. really compose nicely it, with Yeah, other. big, big. I mean, the TPU1 um, went to 8-bit arithmetic. So it turns out for vast classes of inference problems, 8 bits is enough. In fact, there are even there are deep learning applications out there for which 1 bit is enough in the inference side, not in training. Um, so they go to 8 bit because it's you look at the efficiency gains and it's not just the first thing you look at is okay, the arithmetic's cheaper. But the data bandwidth goes down by whatever versus 32 or something larger. Um, even in the even in the training problems, uh, the second and third versions of the TPU use a 16-bit floating point format. Um, and it's, it's not a traditional 16-bit floating point format. It has a larger exponent and a smaller mantissa because they're throwing away precision. They don't need that much precision. So I, I think that's an important thing. There have some, been some interesting results people have gotten. Uh, so for example, there's one group um, that took a weather code, actually the European weather code, which is probably the best, um, converted it to single precision, ran, because the single precision runs faster, you can sort of think of that as enabling you to run more iterations or use a finer grid, right? Either way is okay. So if your limit is, I want to be able to predict the weather 24 hours from now and I, can, and I have three hours to run this code, um, then that's the limit is three hours to run the code. So now if you convert it to single precision, you can actually make the grid size better, and they got better predictive results than running it in a double precision floating point form. So I think there are lots of little pieces like this that are coming around. We'll see more and more of them. Um, but because deep learning things are inherently noisy and they're statistical, mm -hmm. it's the obvious place where you can gain a lot. Do you think there's going to be a lot more movement in that, in that direction? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. I think so. I mean, even in the yeah. training, when they train these now, um, you know, if a weight gets close to zero, they just throw it out. They throw it out, take out the neuron, you know, simplify it. And otherwise, they start, and so this movement now, you take lots, very wide net, and then you just throw out neurons that are, don't have any real significant value in the output, right, in the training set. So now, of course, there's some danger in that, in that you can throw out something that turns out that somebody gave you an example that needed that neuron, but most of the time, um, if your training set's broad enough, you'll be fine. So from the viewpoint of networking, it appears that uh, it could be that high-performance networks are going to be largely used for interconnecting things that are learning and training, and then for the outside world, which is carrying video. Yep. Right? So it's always sort of break, coming into two different applications. Um, yep. Is, yep. That, that's the view as seen from today. Do you think Yeah, you know, I think absolutely. I mean, you look at the top of rack uh, switches in these things, the pressure on the top of rack switches as you begin to boost these things. I mean, the sizes of the data sets mm -hmm are so large, um, it, particularly in the training set, that that's going to drive at least the computer room networking requirements, right? Right, right. And it is, it's also true today that a, a single top of rack switch could carry all of ne Netflix's global data on its own right, right. at any instant in, in, the, in the peak hour of the, of the day. So the, the ratio between the two is, is phenomenal. Any other questions from the floor? Yeah, at the back, Dan. Right? It seems like the guys from the ML world are building their own networks. Are, are we going to win? Are they going to win? Are we going to merge? <laughs> uh, I don't know. It depends probably. Uh, it depends a lot on, there are lots of technology trade-offs if you're building um, your own machine um, where my guess is the networking community is actually building the right silicon. 
Whether or not they're packaging exactly the way these guys want it, that's a separate question. And we're getting, the space is more fractured, right? That's what's basically happening. This is happening everywhere in the hardware space, by the way. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things you see happening is, you know, I'll have four different versions of a phone. Each one will want a slightly different ML processor for their camera, right, or their voice recognition. So I think we're going to see this movement towards more variations in hardware and how that affects what might happen on the networking side and how things, how things get packaged up. That's going gonna, gonna to change things a bit, I think, around. Any other questions? Yeah, Kellen. What's beyond ML? I mean, everybody is talking about ML now in building ML engines. What's beyond that? Well, beyond first generation ML, let's say that right now I think it's safe to say that um, we know a lot of applications that can use supervised learning. Well, that's fine when I have good enough data sets that are general enough to uh, teach me what I want. It's not going to get us. Uh, it's not going to get us artificial general intelligence. There's just no way you're going to do it with supervised learning. Um, so we're going to have to have. And still, we're we're not very good. I mean, ML's okay at generalizing, but not really. Not really. Um, the other the other thing, the question which I still puzzle about, is think about. Um, a processor that can do the level of recognition, let's say, that a five-year-old can do. Think about the amount of energy that that processor mm -hmm. is going to burn compared to that five-year-old's brain. We're off by six orders of magnitude in terms of energy efficiency over what the human brain can do. Think about how the learning process occurs. Five-year-olds, since I have a, I have a seven-month-old granddaughter, who teaches her how to do the things she does? Nobody teaches her. She kind of learns, some by observation, some by trial and error. Um, we have this rig, oh, we take a giant data set, we plug all that stuff in. You know, somehow the human brain, given the benefits of a few million years of evolution, has developed a learning capability that despite the progress of ML, we're not even close to matching. So I think that's going to be a, an opportunity for lots of inspiration and lots of thinking about what the future might look like. Question over here. Yeah, I think there are some things that could help. Um, Can you just repeat the question? Uh, the I question is, what, are there opportunities for material science or other materials? I mean, I, you know, quantum may happen. I think it's a very hard problem to scale up to get there. I think carbon nanofiber has some possibilities. I think if we can go to 3D stack things, which are very hard to do with traditional silicon, but uh, we can do with the Intel memory systems, the Optane memory systems, for example. Um, so if we can go to th real 3D, as opposed to sort of two and a half, which is what the high bandwidth memory kind of stuff gives us, uh, that would be a real benefit. Um, you've got to pay attention to energy a lot because you're not going to stack chips that burn 200 watts on top of one another, there's no way to get the heat out. So, um, but I think there's some things there that could help. Maybe there'd be a breakthrough in packaging technology that would help. Um, hard problem, but it, it's possible. Um, and then I think we ought to got to poke around. I mean, it's a time when you need to be, the way I think about technology is if it's on the lab, if it's on the lab bench of a physicist, it's 10 years before the engineers are going to get their hands on it. Right? So that's a way to think about how long that investment has to be. And you've got to compete against this enormously successful industry. Even if Moore's Law slows down to half what it was, it's still a phenomenal rate of improvement. And you've got to be able to beat that. That's a hard benchmark to beat. So you've got to think about something that's really out there ways. I mean, obviously, better integration of silicon and optical materials would be great for everybody who's got to communicate distance. And if it really could be made energy efficient, um, then it would have uses inside a large rack, for example. Maybe not chip to chip, but, but board to board, for sure, for right. sure. And before we leave CMOS, one of the things that I've observed is that it's becoming more affordable again in a university environment to actually fabricate silicon because the difference between 
the fabs that have been paid for right. and the leading edge is actually right. shrunk because right. of the slowdown and the advancement. And so right. actually, I think we're going to start to see both in universities and in startups more architectural innovation that involves building. I, I agree with that. As long as you don't push to the bleeding edge, yep. you have availability. And I think in, in applications where cost matters, that's really important. So. I think we have time for one last question. Andy. Yeah, Feynman did work on reversible computing. It was his inspiration. I mean, he was yeah. sort of the proposer of quantum uh, computing, right, which is a, is a potentially reversible method. Um, the difficulty in quantum is very simple. You need, the, you need a very large system state to stay in this coherent mode where even a, small, a person walking across the room will throw it out of uh, its coherent state. So that's going to be the very hard problem. Not can we build very small qubits, numbers of qubits, but can we build large machines that have low enough error rates in the qubits that we can build to something where the size will be interesting. Um, I, there's no doubt the, the physics is tremendously interesting in trying to ask the questions. So there'll be lots of side effects of that technology when we actually get a quantum computer that's interesting enough to do a computation, um, that remains to be seen. So. Good. Well, thank you so much. OK. Really thank you. Appreciate you thank you so much. Thanks very much. Thank you.